Welcome to Curious Chronicles. Explore captivating tales, mind-blowing facts, and hidden confessions with us. Story 1. My sister and her husband spoke badly about me, 25 female, and my partner, 30 male, in front of the whole family. Recently, I went on a holiday with my partner to his home country. My family went on another holiday to an island. My partner lives in Australia with me and has all his family in Colombia except his brother. His brother lives in Canada and he hasn't seen him for seven years, his twin brother. My family's trip and his brother returning to South America coincided. I see my family all the time except my sister who lives in Europe who I saw earlier this year. My partner and I agreed we can go to South America during this time and not go on the family trip my family had and this year we will travel to Europe to see my sister, the rest of whom I see all the time in my home country. I come back and find out my sister and her husband said at a dinner on their holiday with many family members, mom, brother, cousins, etc. She said, you should find someone who loves you and doesn't take you away from your family. Her partner then comments, like Rick, my partner's name. My brother then proceeds to say, I'm not married, so I shouldn't possibly put my partner's needs first. I then found out my brother-in-law said on separate occasions, they won't last. He never met Rick and barely knows himself as he lives in Europe. This is hypocritical since my sister moved to Europe and left all her family to be with her loser husband. At this point, I am so angry that they're talking about my partner and I am an open forum. I need advice as to next steps and how if I should confront them. I mean, for one, I will say, you have a right to be upset, but at the same time, families always talk about other stuff, other family members and everything, their lives when they're not there. People talk about people who aren't there all the time. It's a part of life, and I don't necessarily feel like what they're saying is, like, so out of line as to be unforgivable, but it's kind of crappy. I would definitely talk with them and just say, hey, I don't appreciate you saying that. I'm in a happy relationship. You don't know all the details, and you don't get to judge. If they're going to keep talking like that, then F them. You know how you prove them wrong? How you, you know, how you show them that what they're saying is crap? Live a good life with him. Be happy. And if they still have a problem with it, then, then you probably don't want to be around them in the first place. So that's the best advice I got. Otherwise, I just, I wouldn't let it get to you too much. People are always going to say crap. Story two. A lady steals from me. Jokes on her. She's been poking around for years. She lives across the street. She takes my mail, fruit from my trees, things from my yard. I've caught her multiple times, but she seems to think she has every right. Never enough for me to take legal actions. To be honest, I'm busy as hell these days. One day, she was by my mailbox with her dogs in her pajamas, reading a letter from my bank regarding my small car loan, just standing there, reading glasses on, cigarette in hand, reading it. I confronted her and said opening people's mail is a crime. Not like you have the money to fight it. <laughs> I thought it was fine. You want to read someone's mail? I'll give you enough of your own to read. There's a religious organization nearby. Not sure if they're a cult or a legit organized religion. They leave notes and knock on doors, that type of thing. I'm always kind enough to them, so I get their propaganda in the mailbox every now and again. I used a VPN to go to their website. They had some type of questionnaire slash application thing. I used a fake email address, fake name, but her address. I also, it also wanted a phone number. Her dog comes and craps on my lawn every evening. One night I saw him out there, gave him an unsuspecting pat, and took a photo of the tag on his collar. Scurried back home and redid the application with her address and phone number. I see them come by four times a week to her house now. Random times, sometimes 7 a.m., sometimes 8 p.m., most weekends. Knocking, leaving massive packs of paper and crap in her mailbox on the porch. I just know they're most likely calling her constantly, too. There you go, nosy neighbor. Lots of important scripture to read and keep you busy. Enjoy. I mean, okay. That is definitely a, a, a good little prank to pull on her. It'll be a bit irritating. Um, All the extra mail and stuff is... Pretty easy to just toss in the old recycling bin, so uh, the knocks on the door would be irritating. But I will say this, opening other people's mail is a federal crime. You don't need an amazing lawyer or anything. You can just get some recordings of her doing that. Like seriously, get, get yourself a cheap little ring camera or whatever, set it up to watch that. When she does that stuff, keep your evidence. And then go to a lawyer and be like, do I, find a lawyer who's not going to charge you unless you win or whatever. And be like, 
I'd like to sue her, or I'd like to take her to court. This is a crime. And take her to court. I Just please, because holy crap, this woman's a piece of garbage. I just hate her. Story 1. My, 27 male, low empathy nephew, 19 male, just bought a gun. Should I be concerned? I'm a little concerned, even if it may be irrational, but he's pretty antisocial, doesn't have any close people in his life. I tried to be, but didn't work out. He also doesn't believe people can be close emotionally, and is very low in empathy. He can be a bit aggressive at times, too. I'm not sure if I'd say I've ever seen extremely concerning behavior from him, but this move of buying a gun does concern me a bit. I spent two years trying to get to know him and support him and become close, but it never went anywhere. He has no interest in other people and even said so himself that he doesn't care, which is weird given that he reads self-improvement books, some of them even being on socializing. I don't know. I'm not a huge fan of guns, but I grew around lots of them. Um, I don't, uh, you know, hold it against anyone who owns a gun. I think that's your choice, even if I'm uncomfortable with it. I mean, maybe he's just trying to get into a hobby of, like, you know, uh, a hobby shooting or hunting or something. Um, should you be concerned? I mean, maybe a little if he's that antisocial and doesn't get close to people, but also if you haven't seen any concerning behavior, like where he seems to be extra angry or becoming more distant or something, I don't know. I don't know how concerned you should be. I'm concerned reading it, but I might be overreacting. Story 2. I accidentally scammed a scammer. I had a $1,500 item on eBay once, and someone bought it. I was on top of things, so I shipped it out the same day. The next day, the person messaged me to send it to a different address than what was in their account. I knew about that scam, but I had already sent it. I expected them to try to get their money back, so I went to the post office and filled out the form to recall the item. A few days later, I had it back and put it up for sale again. I kept my eye on the scammer's account, waiting for them to claim that they never got the item, and one day saw that they deleted their account, and I got to keep the money. I ended up getting $3,000 for that thing. Thanks for the extra money, scammer. I mean, there's not a lot of instances where I would want to keep $1,500 from somebody, but if it's someone who's trying to scam you, and then they got scared off the site, probably because of their scamming, I would assume, then, yeah, like, I'm not gonna, like, go to eBay and be like, Hey, eBay, I got this, I got this $1,500, but it, I, you know, I didn't give them the item. They were a scammer. What do I do with this money? And eBay would probably be like, oh, we'll hold on to that for you. Don't you worry. We'll, we'll make sure it gets to the right place. The right place is in their pockets. I don't think so, eBay. That money belongs to that person now. Finders keepers. Scammers, scammer, scammy scammers. Scam? Yeah. Story three. Today I effed up by insulting my wife's intelligence. I absolutely love my wife, but she's really stubborn about dumb crap. Throw away, but I'm absolutely stunned to learn she doesn't know how metric measurements work. Today I effed up by calling her out on it. She always seems to confuse ounces and milliliters, but I figured she just misspoke and usually could figure out what she meant. We have children together, and now I'm starting to realize she thinks metric is just another name for the same measurements. Seriously, it had a huge argument about how many fluid ounces we're feeding our baby. I asked, why did you tell the pediatrician we're giving three milliliters per feeding? It's three ounces. That's a huge difference. She looked at me completely seriously and said, those are the same thing. I said, wait, what are you talking about? And she proceeded to tell me how she learned that milliliters are equivalent to fluid ounces in nursing school and that she didn't make a mistake. I explained that she must have misunderstood because that doesn't make sense. She swore that she was correct and she wasn't wrong. I was stunned. Then I asked, why would there be two naming systems for measurements if they're the exact same? She said that metric is just the names Europeans use. LOL, we're American. Shocker. When I showed her the correct conversion on Google, she suddenly backtracked and tried to say that it must have changed since we went to school. <laughs> LOL, what? And then that she actually meant ounces are equal to liters, which is even worse. Here's where I effed up. In my shocked frustration, I said, well, crap, no wonder you didn't pass your exams. You can't be giving people lethal doses. Now she's peed at me. Oof, I mean, I would have a little bit hard time not trying to make a joke as well. I feel like 
you are trying to make a joke to diffuse some tension in the situation, but your joke was at the expense of that tension and probably just made it way worse, I'm guessing. I mean, yeah, she's peed at you now, which I can get that, and probably bringing up her not passing her exams was not a sore spot that needed poking. But, yeah, I mean, in school, we were taught so much about, like, the differences of metric and, you know, um, imperial units that we use here and one other country uses or two or whatever it is. It's not many. But I remember in science classes and in when I was doing, like, uh, my certified nursing assistant classes, yeah, like, we use the metric system a lot in medicine and in science because it's a very easy unit to use and it's very smart and I hate that we don't use it here, but whatever. But for her to, like, like, I can get people not knowing that because it is weird and confusing. It's weird growing up in a country that doesn't use it and then trying to reconcile that when it's being used. But, folks, it's okay to just admit when you were wrong and didn't know something. I've not known things. We all have gaps in our knowledge. Guaranteed, as enough time goes by, there will be something that this husband will say that the wife will be like, what the hell are you talking about? Everybody has those gaps. It's okay when you're called out on it to just be like, oh man, I've thought this the whole time and been wrong. Well, now I know. It's that easy. Story one. My divorced boyfriend is afraid of getting married. My, 29 female, boyfriend, 32 male, and I have been together for three years, living together for one and a half. When we first met, he had been divorced and single for three years after a three-year relationship slash marriage. Early in our relationship, I made it very clear that marriage is something that's important to me, and even went as far as telling him multiple times to let me know if he decides he doesn't want to marry me. Things were moving forward at a pace I thought we were both comfortable with, and we had various discussions regarding timelines before and after moving in together. We discussed moving in together as a step toward getting engaged married, and a timeline of engagement sometime after a year of living together. So, sometime after a year of living together, he made an appointment for me to try on engagement rings. I asked him several times, and on the day of it, he was sure. I wasn't pressuring him, etc., as I only want to do this if he really wants to. He said he was excited, so we went. I thought we had a great time and could tell he didn't feel the same way, but he said it was great. A few months later, I pushed until he admitted that he panicked after the appointment and was afraid of marriage. He didn't say anything at the time because he didn't want to worry me with thoughts he hadn't fully flushed out, but I could tell he's been feeling off while he insisted he was fine or happy the last few months. Now I'm worried that I'm going to be waiting around slash wasting time for several years while he figures out what he wants. I'm afraid that if he does ever propose, I'll have to be afraid of him panicking afterwards or him standing me up at the altar because he panics on the wedding day. I think everything was great when we were just dating, but now that engagement and marriage is on the next step, I think he's freaked out due to his past relationship slash divorce. If he just needs time or wants to date longer, I'd get it, but I'm nervous that he's just not ready, and me asking about a timeline is pressuring him. I love him dearly and want to spend my life with him, but I also want to spend my life with someone who's excited about me, not panicked. I think this could be a blip in our relationship, slash just part of growing together, slash doing the work to be ready for marriage, or it could be something I'll look back on years from now wishing I had left now. I, too, I had some relationship baggage. I'm not comfortable just wa waiting in limbo until he decides what he wants to do, so he suggested a monthly update conversation that he initiates. Do you think that's enough? Anything you would do to become more comfortable with the situation? I mean, yeah, if he's been through a divorce and it clearly had an effect on him, it might take him a little bit of time. He might have, you know, past traumas for that, that he's still kind of processing through. I think his monthly checkup is good. I think having relationship checkups in general is a healthy thing to do. My partner and I do it just literally anytime you can sit down with your partner and be like, hey, relationship check, how are things doing? Any, you know, like open and honest. I'm a, I'm a huge advocate for open, honest communication. 
I would also suggest possibly looking into some couples counseling. You don't always have to do it because there's some huge issue that's, you know, shoving you apart or whatever. It could just be having a third party mediator to better understand where each of you is at. And so you can both, yeah, just understanding really, honestly, I think helps. And having someone third party there who can weigh in on it can mean a lot to comfort people who are stressed and everything. So. Those would be my big recommendations. I know therapy is expensive and not accessible to everyone. So even just a trusted third party friend might help out as well. Third party friend, what? Story two, she's bankrupt, I'm debt free. About six years ago, my former partner of six years and I broke up and I started to realize all of the things I had normalized were actually abuse. Instances of gaslighting were all too prevalent, even one instance where she gaslit me about what gaslighting even was. Financial, she could spend what she wanted, I had to ask permission, even limiting time that I spent with my family and my best mate. There was more, but that's enough of that. After we broke up, I realized that the money I would continued to put into our joint account wasn't going to the mortgage as promised, but was going shopping, paying for her new partner, who it turned out was on the scene months before we split, and wasn't the first, and payments to her lawyer. When I found this out, I called the finance company handling our mortgage and told them I would no longer be making payments. I told them they could seize the house if they wanted, but my half of the payments would cease immediately until I had recouped the money stolen, roughly five months worth of payments. They said I couldn't do that. I told them to watch me. Soon after that, when the debt letters and dishonor started, the texts, phone calls, and voicemails from her started. I ignored everyone. Two months in, I heard her car broke down badly because she couldn't afford to maintain it. Not long after that, she filed for bankruptcy. A month later, she moved out and I got my house back. I cleaned it up, changed the locks, got my mortgage back in front, and recently my wife and I sold it for a tidy little profit. She got nothing. Not a dollar, not a dime. She has no usable credit rating and my wife and I are debt free with a deposit on our new home. Feels good. I can't really blame you. I don't know what went wrong in that relationship, but yeah, if you were putting in your money for those mortgage payments and it was not being used for that and being stolen, yeah, she effed up big time. And I think, you know, I'm glad that it paid out, played out well for you and that you weren't like, I'm going to stop payments. And suddenly it was just a world of trouble because I don't understand finances and mortgages and loans and all that stuff very well, but I do know that they are frightening and can screw up your life. Hooray! Thank goodness that it's not almost required as part of living. Story 3. Today I effed up when I reacted positively to being catcalled. This morning, my girlfriend, 25, and I, 28 male, passed a group of young guys, late teens, more or less, as we were walking down the street. One of the guys waited until we had our backs toward the group before shouting, Nice butt! At that moment, my girlfriend turned around and yelled, Grow the F up! The loudmouth guy laughed like an evil anime character and said, I was talking to your boyfriend. The whole group was like, my girlfriend looked at me and asked why I was smiling. I didn't even realize I was smiling until she pointed it out. I said, no one has ever complimented my butt before. My girlfriend said being catcalled is not a compliment and asked if I was going to walk away without saying anything. I said, if I was going to open my mouth, it would be to say, thank you for appreciating my butt. My girlfriend and I did not see eye to eye about the situation at all, and now there is unnecessary tension between us. Yeah, it's almost like you haven't spent your entire adult life being objectified by men, uh, and also don't necessarily have to feel uh, threatened by men who do stuff like that because of terrible things that happen to people, you know, being catcalled, you know? Um, seriously, like, I know that guys like to be flattered by that, and oftentimes guys are a little starved when it comes to being complimented on things like that. And, but catcalling is gross. It's objectification and oftentimes can feel very, very threatening to those being catcalled. Oftentimes they are alone. They are outnumbered. It's not comfortable. And just the fact that, oh, it happened to be about you and you've never had to experience it and you haven't had to go through all of the negative stuff that is associated with that, I think you should try and see it from your girlfriend's perspective, which is catcalling isn't cool. Even if you don't feel threatened in that moment, it's still not something that you should encourage. And 
while you should, as a man, be able to be complimented, you know, about certain things that men might not traditionally be complimented about in our society, it doesn't mean that you should encourage objectification. This is not a, this is not a simple subject to tackle, and I'm done trying. <laughs> Story 1. My, 28 female, boyfriend, 32 male, stopped being an intimate beast and became romantic and caring. Hey, so me and my man have been in a relationship for one and a half years. When we started meeting, my boyfriend was an intimate beast. He wanted intercourse nonstop, very hard, and many different types, positions, etc. He was obsessed about it and wanted to discover new things. I kind of felt objectified, but it was good to be with him anyways, and I wasn't sure if he is with me only for intercourse. Last time, he completely changed. He still likes intercourse, but became more delicate and emotional, caring. I see that he looks at me in a completely different way. Last time, he didn't even want intercourse that much as before, which I wanted more. He just preferred to lie down and cuddle all night, kiss, and look at each other. He also started to talk with me more, and before, he wasn't that much open. Should I worry, or is it a good sign? What do you guys think? I mean, I think most people would, you know, think it's a good thing that someone wants to become more, you know, romantically intimate with you, you know, cuddle, kiss, learn about you, stuff like that. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, and usually that whole, like, honeymoon phase in a relationship, it starts off, you know, fiery, passionate, you know, at the beginning, and kind of winds down. For some folks, it winds down after, you know, half a year, for some folks a year or so, whatever. It, it, it seems perfectly normal in my mind. I don't really see a huge issue here, but I mean, if he's really not wanting any intercourse for, like, prolonged periods, then you might need to have a talk or something, and that's fine. But otherwise, I, I, I don't see the issue. Story 2. Refuse to admit you made a mistake? That's fine. I'll take 240 as my grade. This is pretty short, but I think it's a pretty funny story. Last semester in my geography class, we had a big test a few weeks before exams. The teacher of this class was new and notorious for being a bee with a god complex who can't admit when she's wrong. So I take this test, and when I check my grade, it says 89 out of 37. I realize that she's made a mistake, and I quickly email her with a screenshot of the grade, to which she responds, I didn't make a mistake. If you're unhappy with your grade, then you should have studied more. Well, I just screenshot the email and laugh about it with my friends. Well, the end of the semester rolls around, and I end the semester with a 200 in her class because she was too crabby to admit she was wrong. All right, did you end with a 200 or a 240? Because we got some conflicting information here. That means that makes a difference to me. I don't know if I can trust you on this, but also, yeah, it seems like whoever this teacher is is pretty checked out. If you can email her about a mistake in a grade that is drastically in your favor, and she's just like, I don't make any mistakes. You're amazing. Your paper was so good, it just it blew my mind out. I'm still trying to recover from it. So if you don't like it, then too bad. Okay. Story three. Today I effed up by accidentally deleting my university's entire database. Obligatory this didn't happen today, but last week when I was interning at my university's IT department. So I'm a third year computer science student doing an internship to get some experience. Mostly I've been doing simple tech support and handling basic issues. My supervisor asked me to clean up some old files on one of the servers to free up space. He left for a meeting and I got to work. Now, I know my way around Linux and servers, I thought this would be easy. As I was deleting old log files and backups, I accidentally typed rm-rf into the wrong directory. I instantly realized my mistake, but it was too late. I had just wiped every single file on the main database server. Panic set in. Five years of records, course materials, enrollment info, you name it, gone in ten seconds of stupidity. I broke into a cold sweat, paralyzed, not knowing what to do. The server was redundant, so data could be restored from backups, but those were in the hands of another department. I had to confess to my supervisor what just happened. He turned ghostly white, swore a bit, but then focused on contacting the backup admins to start an emergency restoration. I spent the rest of the week helping get data back online and apologizing profusely. At the end of my internship, my supervisor said I caused some of the most dramatic on-the-job experience he's ever witnessed, but appreciated how I owned up to my mistake and helped fix it. While they'll be double-checking any commands I enter for now on, I'm still welcome back again next term. Lesson learned. 
Be very careful when wielding powerful commands, especially on production servers. RIP data, you will not be forgotten. I will always be haunted by that RM minus RF. It does always amaze me that there are certain just like tiny mistakes you can make with computers if you're in the right or wrong spot of a computer where it's like, oh, did you did you enter in something on the wrong line or did you click the wrong thing? Well, everything's gone now. You've screwed everything up. Everything hinged on this one little thing that we've given you access to. There's no like prompt that'll come up and be like, are you really sure you want to do this? Because it'll be bad. The computer just goes, okay, blah, and data everywhere. Ugh, this is why I will never get into anything computer programmy, techy, smart. Story four. Entitled mom took my phone on airplane. I was on a six-hour flight a few years ago. I was in the window seat, and there was a cute five-ish year old in the middle and an entitled mom on the aisle. Before takeoff, she looks at me and says, I hope you have a big bladder because we are not moving. <laughs> okay, here we go. So I had downloaded several Netflix shows and comedy specials to keep me occupied, and I put my corded earbuds in, because I'm cheap, and settled in to close my eyes and relax to some Jim Gaffigan. A while later, I feel my earbuds being ripped from my ears. I look over, and the entitled mom has my phone in her hands trying to unlock it. Of course, I was like, what are you doing? Give that back. She just said I was sleeping, I wasn't, but that's not even the point, and didn't need it. Her kid did. Her kid was coloring in his coloring book, by the way, and was looking quite content. And the airline has movie screens in the seat backs. But I think she didn't want to pay for earbuds. She started holding the phone away from me out in the aisle and saying that I needed to let her son use it because he was bored. She got loud and a flight attendant came over. She tattled on me that I wasn't sharing my phone. She couldn't stop yelling at the attendant about what a bee I am and how my mother should be ashamed. I was like 45 at the time for raising such a jerk. Fortunately, the flight wasn't completely full, so she moved them. The flight attendant had to pry the phone out of her claw and threatened to have police waiting to arrest her if she didn't go with her. They were replaced with a lovely woman who just read her book and left me to my Netflix for the rest of the flight. Poor kid. He seemed really sweet. Too bad his mom is nuts. What is wrong with these entitled people? You just take someone's phone? It's like, you're sleeping. My kid needs this. It's like... What is what? Are you out of your mind? Oh, definitely that poor kid. Oh my gosh. It's like that mom is actively trying to make her child a worse person by giving a terrible example and giving the child things they don't even need. What? Stop it. People, people who are entitled like this, you need to stop because eventually the rest of us are going to snap and you will get what we give you. Story one, am I the a-hole for telling my mom no one asked you to have another kid? I'll give background to who I am. I'm 16 male with two parents, one 38 female, one 40 male, three younger sisters, one 14, one is two, and one due in March. I'm in high school junior year, doing well, passing my classes with mostly A's, making honor roll every year, and a good kid in high school. I wouldn't consider myself a lazy person either, as I work out three to five times a week, wrestle during the winter, and clean the house two to five times a week. I don't normally socialize out often outside of school, as I don't feel motivated to do so, so then I just stay inside and either play my game, read, study a language, or pray. Three years ago, my mom and dad both worked. My mom used to work around 50 to 80 hours a week to catch up on bills. Oftentimes, she would come home tired and would sleep during the day, while my dad would work around 40 to 50-ish hours and would be tired too. Oftentimes, my mom would complain about no one doing anything around the house and call me and my sister lazy. I usually don't say anything to those complaints, but sometimes I get irritated and say I actually clean around the house and that you only sleep, so of course you wouldn't pay attention. Moving forward a year or so when my mom announced she was pregnant, I was kind of irritated because she would always complain about bills and how she needed to catch up on them. I proceeded to say, how are you going to say you need to catch up on bills but then have another child? I can't remember what she had told me, but a month or two later, the reason she wanted to have another kid was because I love being a mother. In my head at the time, I kind of seen it as selfish as she didn't want to be alone. 
Somewhere in June or July 2023, my mom was pregnant, but then had a miscarriage five weeks later. Two weeks later, she got pregnant again with a girl. I wanted to work over the summer and to be a little bit more independent, as I'm only a few years from being a legal adult, so I asked my mom if I could work. She said yes, but she needs to get money for an ID. The next thing you know, she never gives me my ID to work. My mom complains that I go out a lot and give my attention to my girlfriend instead of my baby sister or the things around the house saying I half-butt things around here. Many times, I don't have a problem with playing or watching my sister, but at times my mom makes it seem like I'm obligated to watch my sister anytime she's tired from work or sees she's struggling. And that she once again says she pays for everything and all I do is ask for items just because I clean the house like I'm supposed to do which I feel as isn't true as I hardly ask for wants. One comment she said was, I can walk to school. Mind you, it's winter, and when I wanted to walk to school, she said it was not safe to do so. And she won't be paying my phone bill anymore as it's her money and have my girlfriend pay for it instead. I made the comment when I wanted to work, you said no because I'm not ready, then started yelling at me, telling me to go to my room while slamming the doors. First off, this mom is sending a lot of weird mixed messages, um, which, to be fair, if she's pregnant, hormones are going to play havoc with the brain and everything, so there can be a little leeway given there, but, I mean, this sounds like these problems extend beyond just the pregnancy. And also, like, holding these things against a kid who's clearly helping her out around the house, but then also wants to have a social life, like, I'm sorry, Mom and Dad that you're having to work so many hours. That sucks. That's a terrible part of the economy, but you also can't be taking that out on your kids. And having another kid just because you love being a mother, that's not good, especially if you're struggling to get by and not able to provide for the kids you already have and you want another huge expense. Like, I don't care how much you love being a mother. You want to be able to provide for the people you make and love and keep in your life. I don't know. There's a lot going on here that's just not okay. And it sounds like the parents are struggling and having a lot of troubles, but they're putting the weight of all those on their kids, which just isn't right. Story 2. My mom neglected me and ditched me for her new family, so I decided to ditch her as well. Little background of myself, I'm a 19 male, was born when my mom was 17 and my dad was 19. My dad has been in prison the majority of my life for non-violent drug charges. My mom got married when I was 10 to my stepdad. Just to clarify, my mom and dad were never married. They dated each other and eventually hooked up and had me. My problems with my mom started when she got pregnant with my sister, and then after she had my sister, she got pregnant again and had my brother, and I became like a ghost she hardly paid attention to me. She neglected me emotionally, and I felt like I was unwanted in her life. It didn't matter anymore. As I grew up, I continued to try to get her to talk to me, but she was always busy. With my brother and sister, every family activity they did together, she always excluded me. It was always my stepdad and mom and my siblings, except for me, like I wasn't part of the family. This is how I came to my conclusion that my mom hates me or she dislikes me. As I mentioned before, I have two younger siblings aged four and nine. One day, my mom comes into my room. She's all dressed up and racing around, and I ask if she's going somewhere. She tells me no, and I go back to playing on my computer. No later than 15 minutes, I hear the garage door go up, so I race downstairs thinking, what the heck? Sure enough, my mom, stepdad, and my sister and brother are all dressed up and in the truck, and I'm standing outside feeling really uncomfortable. The look she gave me as she jumped into the truck made me feel like I was interrupting her. There wasn't an, oh yeah, sorry, it was just a look of absolute disgust. I don't cry very easily, but something about the whole thing really got to me, and I went back inside and cried a bit, but then got over it. Wasn't the first time. She texts me ten minutes later, telling me they're just going to the park. I don't respond because I would have just worked myself up again. Fast forward, they get home, I was eating dinner, and my nine-year-old sister rushes in after my mom is super excited to tell me about everything they had done. They hadn't gone to the park. My mom had lied to me, saying they went to the park when they'd actually gone to Dave & Buster's. They also went to get milkshakes and went shopping. I was visibly crushed by it. My little sister noticed I had gotten upset. 
I could tell my mom was about to start making excuses and making the circumstances my fault, so to keep my little sister and brother from seeing that I excused myself to my room quietly. It super sucked. I've been trying so hard to be a good son despite the selfishness my mother and her chaotically selfish ways have on me, but once I realized that crap isn't normal, I started questioning our relationship. That we once had, I didn't see any safe way out without ending up on the streets broke. 19 years old, unemployed, by the way. So, I joined the army. It was spur of the moment, and she still doesn't know. I can handle it, and it's the first decision I've actually made on my own. I cannot tell you how excited I am for BCT soon. Sorry, everyone. I just wanted to get this off my chest and share my story. Edit. I would like people to know that I don't hate my brother and sister. I like my brother and sister. They also like me. I have good memories of spending time with them. At this point, they're the only thing that I consider family, and I hope they understand why I moved away. I hope that when I come back from the army, they will still see me as their big brother. I would also like people to know that my grandparents from my mom's side of the family passed away already, and my grandparents from my bio dad's side of the family also passed away. My grandmother passed away two years after I was born, and my grandfather passed away when my, my dad was 15 years old. My bio dad is the only child they had. My mom has only one sister, and she's married with three kids. Her kids are around the same age as me, and she and her husband live paycheck to paycheck, and I don't want to be a burden to them. That's why I never went to live with them. <sighs> it's really, really rough to hear all of that, because I genuinely feel like that's not just bad parenting, that's abusive parenting, to, like, neglect your other child like that, to have them raised like that. I mean, whether or not they're 19 and you feel like they should be out on their own or whatever, like, as a parent, it was your job to prepare them for that, to help them get to the point. So, I'm, um, yeah, I just can't side with this mom whatsoever. And as mixed as my feelings can be about, like, the military and stuff like that, I hope, I wish this person well in basic training. I hope that it's a good experience, that they're able to set aside money. And when they're done with it, I hope they're able to have their own place, and realize that, yes, they can still have a wonderful relationship with their little brother and sister, and they don't have to have a relationship with that mom who clearly doesn't want a relationship with them, which is just heartbreaking. But you know what? There are people out there who will love you and treat you right, and I hope you find them. Story 1. I thought my girlfriend was just a single mom, but she hid that she has a grandchild. I, 36 male, have started dating my girlfriend, 37 female, for about two months. I always knew she had a son when she was 19. It didn't bother me because her son doesn't live with them. He has his own place. I haven't met him only once, so I'm relieved that I do not have to bear the responsibility of being a stepdad. Just a few days ago, my girlfriend dropped the bomb that her son just had a baby girl. I was shocked. I didn't know he had a girlfriend, let alone know that he got his girlfriend pregnant, which means my girlfriend knew about it before. I asked her why she didn't tell me this. She said that her son's love life is none of her business. Her son is an adult, so the responsibility of his child is only on him. She may babysit her granddaughter, but no parental responsibility. She still pays for her son's school, so I do not know how she will manage it. I firmly told her that I do not want to be involved in raising his child in any way, not even financially, and all of this is just weird to me. She reassured me that I don't have one, that she has raised her son well enough to take responsibility. I asked her for some space, and she agreed. The last time I had any conversation with her was when she sent me a text apologizing to me for keeping it away from, but she didn't want me to think this is my responsibility. And since she is washing her hands off her son's personal life, she thought it wouldn't be a problem. I don't know how to feel about this. On one hand, I really like her. She's beautiful, smart, kind, and our intimate life is amazing. This is the first relationship I had after divorcing my cheating ex-wife four years ago. I gave up on love after being betrayed until I met my girlfriend. She was welcoming and understanding, but I do not know how to get over the fact that I might just become a step-grandfather. I never wanted kids of my own. That's why I got a vasectomy two years ago. Neither did my girlfriend. I just need some opinion because this is weird to me. I mean, the one thing that I'll say to this person that is kind of a conflict in my mind is they're saying, oh, 
her her child is an adult now, so I don't have to be a stepfather. You do, to an extent. Like, you don't have to be there for the, you know, child-rearing part of it, but you would still be becoming a part of that family, and if her son is a part of her life, then he would be a part of your life. Like, I don't think that you get to, like, date someone and be like, I'm dating you, but your kids? Blah! I don't even care if they're adults. I don't want to see them. I'm not here for them. Like, that's kind of part of becoming someone's family and everything. So the fact that her child is having a grandchild, like, I, I know it's kind of early and you're like, whoa, but you're like, I don't want to be a, you know, stepfather or a step grandfather. I mean, the child, her child was likely to have a child eventually. Was this going to become a problem? I don't know. I feel like there's a conflict there and you're trying to hope that you can have a relationship her without anything else. And maybe that can work, but in my head, it does not. Story two. Am I the a-hole for forcing my partner to communicate? My, 28 female, partner, 28 male, has a lot going on. He got a really sad family illness situation. His dream career he's been working towards for years has just been put at risk. He can't get out of his nine to five job because the market is so poor at the moment, etc. He's really low. He said to me in recent conversations that he's felt empty and doesn't know how long for, and he can't remember the last time he was happy. As soon as he says these things, I try to get him to open up a bit and either talk them through with me or seek help from a professional. And all he says then is, I don't want to talk about it. I don't need support. I'm just going to ignore everything and it will be fine. These things also affect me as I do have a tendency to question, why does he feel empty with me, but I try so hard to rationalize them and have seen professionals to help. It's got to the stage where he has multiple mugs growing mold in his room. When we meet for a date night, he sighs and swears at every little inconvenience, etc. It's really starting to impact me, and the fact that he won't talk to me about anything puts me in a situation where I don't see any hope for this getting better. I feel like if he, if he was willing to speak to someone, he may be able to learn how to deal with emotions in a more healthy way, and this may be less likely to escalate to this level in the future, but he's so unwilling to even speak to me. We're set to move in together in six months, and I'm really questioning that. I do love him, he's got so many good traits, but his lack of ability to deal with emotions crops up constantly. I know people deal with them in different ways, and I don't know if my view that you need to talk and support each other through everything is the right one. Am I the a-hole for saying he either needs to speak to me or a professional, or we need to speak about the relationship? I feel... Like, they must have picked this story specially for me because of how much I talk about how important communication is in a relationship. And it is. And he does need to do this because if it is this constant issue that's cropping up and it's affecting his life in this massive negative way, then he does need that help. But also, I don't think he can be forced into it. He has to make that choice. That's kind of a big part of this stuff. And if he's not willing to do that when it's having an impact on your life, then yeah, I think you're in the right to be like, look, this issue is not just impacting you, but it's impacting our relationship. And if you're not willing to even talk to me about it or a professional, then I think we need to talk about the relationship. That doesn't make you an a-hole. That makes you someone who is not just looking out for him, but yourself. And yeah, if he's not willing to do that, then yeah, I think you need to have a talk. Story three. Today I effed up by dumping a year old grudge on the wrong person. So there's a decent amount of context here. The three main people in this story are Mary, who got me into a friend group, Sarah, the problematic person who led the group, and Beth, one of Sarah's friends, fake names. We're all in our late 20s, early 30s. Near the end of 2021, I became part of a Discord friend group that started with a new friend of mine, Mary, and her friend Sarah. Mary and Sarah created the server together, but eventually had a falling out and Mary left the group. I stayed in, but Sarah had a penchant for drama and immature behavior that led to a lot of conflicts, both involving me and involving other people on the server. 
She regularly pushed physical boundaries with people when she slash they were drunk, tried to get my then girlfriend to hook up with her when I wasn't around, and did a series of other inappropriate things that made me and other people uncomfortable, some of which I experienced, some of which I saw, and some of which I heard from first-hand witnesses. Some of these things would make your skin crawl. Eventually, after being in the group for about a year, there was an incident that made me realize that nobody in the group would confront her when she did things like this, so I effectively ghosted the server. I stopped talking there and instead tried talking to the half dozen or so people I was closest to in DMs, but most either didn't respond or indicated that they would only talk on the server, which I was eventually removed from. Losing all these friends at once hurt, and for a few months I often thought about what I would say to Sarah if I ever saw her again. In my head, I had a list of the worst things she did to me in the group. I realized that this wasn't healthy to keep thinking about, so I stopped thinking about it and became a lot happier. A short while later, I ran into Mary at a party, the original friend who got me into the group but left. We started hanging out as friends again, and for the past couple months, no Discord or anything, and it was nice. But then, last night at Mary's birthday party, I was caught off guard to see Beth, one of Sarah's best friends from the server. I hadn't seen someone from the server in a while, and while drunk, I had a flood of negative feelings, memories, and anxiety wash over me for a bit. I decided it was best to just talk to other people. But then, on the way home, a group of the partygoers all traveled together on the subway, including myself and Beth. Eventually, it was only myself and her left on the train, and I decided, poorly, that I should talk to her. It started as an attempt at explaining why I was avoiding her and or awkward tonight, and quickly spiraled into a bad time. I told her I had a weird feeling when I saw her, remembering the friends from the server that I had lost, her included, but we weren't the closest. I asked if she was still on Sarah's server, and when she said yes, I asked if Sarah was acting any better. Beth asked what I meant, and my drunk idiot brain decided to dump about half of the list of awful things it had stored up from the year prior. Beth was immediately taken aback and rebuffed several of my points, specifically ones that happened to other people and I may have only heard about. Every story was a first-hand witness who described their involvement and discomfort to me, but I decided to pivot to just my accounts. She seemed surprised to hear about some of the things Sarah had done specifically to me, but I could tell I definitely lost the point of the conversation and was basically just having an impromptu meltdown over repressed memories to this person who didn't want to hear it. In the end, I apologized, said I was drunk, and clearly still just hurt over what happened. I told her losing so many friends at once was really hard on me, and I assumed Sarah and other people's allegiance to her and the server were the reason I wasn't hearing from anybody. A half dozen other people had left the server over the same time period due to their own fallings out with Sarah, and they were ghosted too. Beth told me she didn't know why people weren't talking to me and I should ask them, which I pointed out I can't since none will respond to me. It felt like a slightly improved tone for the conversation by this point, still a crap show but less antagonistic, and Beth had to get off the train suddenly with a rushed take care from both of us. So that's how I effed up today. I probably won't hear anything directly from any of the old server mates, but I imagine this incident will wrap its way through the gossip train back to me soon enough. I'll be honest, I don't see this as an F up. I see this as you being able to vent some stuff that you've been hanging on to to someone that you were at least kind of friends with who might be able to relay that back to other people who are still there who may also be having problems and they might be able to think about like, hey, a number of people have all gone from the server. Is this actually an issue? Yeah, you might have been a bit drunk, you might not have presented the information in the best possible way, but it sounds like this Beth person was at least listening to some degree and hearing you out. So, I mean, the reason I don't think it's an F-up is even if Beth hears this and they just go back to be like, can you believe she said that? Ha 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 ha, let's ignore everything she said. Like, you're still just kind of where you started before that night, you know, with them not really talking to you and sucks to people who are going to be like that to you. So like worst case scenario, you're still just kind of at the same level. They might just say some stuff about you, which maybe they were, maybe they won't. You don't know if they're not talking to you, screw them. But best case scenario, maybe you actually made an impact. So yeah, I don't know. I don't see that as an F up at all. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.